Thy kingdom come, Lord, teach us how to pray for all to know your joy, your peace and love, and know your friendship each and every day. The breath of Christ the Father's gentle dove. Hello, welcome to church today. It's great that you've chosen to join us. Um, I'm Mike and this is my wife Rachel and we're here to welcome you to church. So wherever you are, uh, whatever you're doing right now, wherever you're watching from, whether that's stood up, sat down at your kitchen, in your living room, uh, with the rest of your, um, rest of your household, um, or you're just getting a few quiet moments to yourself, Welcome, it's great that you've chosen to join us today. So it's week 16 or thereabouts of lockdown. Um, who knew? Who knew we would still be here meeting in this way? Well, of course, God knew. And by his grace, uh, we've done it this far. And by his grace, we're going to continue. Um, his um, grace is sufficient for all we need um, throughout this season. 
And last week, um, Andy gave an update for us all on where things are at um, with with returning to doing church under the same roof, uh, meeting together in our church buildings. And if you've not watched that already, it's on our YouTube channel and I highly recommend uh, you watch that so you know um, where we're at and uh, what what's going on. For now, we're still here. Uh, we're meeting online, um, but also with the lifting of restrictions, you, you might be comfortable, and of course it's if you're comfortable to do so, uh, planning a socially distanced um, get together. Um, two households or bubbles can get together and perhaps you might like to do a post-church meetup where you could have um, tea, coffee and biscuits. Um, of course, custard creams are optional, although it does add to the, um, add to the church experience. And of course, we're wanting to continue supporting you throughout this season. Uh, so if anyone is struggling uh, throughout, um, throughout lockdown as, as things change, do get in touch. Uh, phone the office, um, email the, um, the email address which will appear um, just below us right now. And um, we want to be praying for you. We want to be supporting you um, in, in, any, um, in any way that we can. Um, we're church family and we're all in this together. Yes, and one of those ways that we can continue to support and encourage one another has been our Soak and Seek evenings, which we've just had um, earlier this week. And it was great to get together. Um, Mike and I um, had the privilege of leading that evening with you and it was just wonderful to be encouraged together and to pray together and to hear from God together. Um, so I'd encourage you when we have one of those in another, not this Wednesday, the Wednesday after, um, do join us and come and pray with us and lean into what God has to say to us. Um, I was encouraged this week particularly as we um, seem to dwell a lot on the person of Jesus and not only did we see his awesome and mighty majestic power um, as we looked at a psalm and other things that just reflected the the great uh, character of Jesus and, and of God, we also thought about his meekness and um, just heard how he wants to be near to us. Um, so I encourage you um, with that, come and join us at So Can Seek as we continue to hear from God and uh, to learn more from him through this time. And of course, as you're praying, um, if words, pictures, scripture come to mind, do do email them in. We we want to hear from you. We want to hear what God's doing. And there's an email address, ourstories um, at ccchillworld.org.uk. You can send them to that or, um, yeah, drop, um, drop us a message because um, we want to hear. We want to hear what God is doing uh, in your lives. So today's service, um, Ruth will be bringing us our Bible reading today followed by Ryan, who has prepared a sermon for us to hear. And we also have an interview with Helen Cranley, which will be coming up later in the service. And this week, as a um, uh, our, our musicians from church have been putting together some pre-recorded worship, so we have worship led by the musicians of Christchurch, um, which, is, um, which is really good for us all to um, join in with. Also on our YouTube channel today is the Parish Prayers led by Stephen Scott um, and our popular um, children's service with fun songs, craft and stories. Do, um, um, yeah, do, do look on the YouTube channel because there's other things there as well. There's the encouragement vlogs, lots of stuff to, um, to, to watch. Uh, so as we begin our service this morning, I'm just going to pray for us. Um, so uh, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that as we meet, um, dispersed as we are, we thank you, Father God, that you are with us. Um, wherever we are in our homes or out and about, we thank you that you um, continue to walk with us. Um, however, we're finding this time, whether we are breezing on through or um, feel like we're wading through mud, Father, we thank you that you are with us. And we pray this morning that as we think about how we can love uh, one another, how we can serve one another. I pray that you would speak clearly to our hearts and minds this morning. Um, and we just pray uh, for your blessing upon us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
The Parable of the Good Samaritan On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbour as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, Who is my neighbour? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he travelled, came where the man was and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was neighbour to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert of the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Hello, and don't worry, you haven't stumbled into an episode of Ready, Steady, Cook. Um, I just wanted to start off on what I hope is common ground for us all before we dig into the passage we just had read for us. Um, and that's to say, I hope we can agree that cake is a wonderful thing. From a few simple ingredients, you can make something magical that, that transforms a mealtime, an event, or, or someone's whole day. And all the ingredients um, that you need are, are, are right here. But you do need all the ingredients. If I tried to make a cake but, but only had half of these ingredients, I, I wouldn't get half a cake. I'd get some sort of inedible mess that, that wouldn't make anyone's day better at all. And here in Luke um, and, and also in, in Matthew, we, we're given in a way, a, a recipe, but it's but it's a recipe for for life in the form of the two greatest commandments that God's given us, which which if we follow them, are truly life changing, world changing, but only if we if we follow them both, only if we have all the right ingredients together and in the right balance. So we looked at the first commandment last week with Katrina to, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. And, and the second is to love your neighbour as yourself. And there's, there's an up to God aspect to these commandments. There's, there's out to our neighbours and there's also in to ourselves. And we need to hold those, those ingredients in the right balance, if we're going to get the recipe right, if we're going to get a real taste of the heaven on earth that God has for us. So in our passage today in Luke, we hear an expert in Jewish religious law correctly identifying those two commandments, but he then follows it up with the question, who is my neighbour? And Jesus then tells a story about the Good Samaritan, which is probably all too familiar to many of us, but would have been shocking to those who were listening to him at the time, because the Jews 
and the Samaritans were, were sworn enemies. They, they were prejudiced against each other, separated by hundreds of years, centuries, um, because of differences in their ethnicity, their, their beliefs, their religion, and their culture. Modern day equivalents might be the Serbs and the Muslims in Bosnia or the Catholics and the Protestants in Ireland. But Jesus doesn't get drawn into the question of who my neighbour is and, and isn't, but rather uses this story to illustrate what it means to follow the command, love your neighbour as yourself. And I noticed several things about how Jesus wants us to, to love our neighbour, those around us. First of all, we see that that uh, this man, he asks Jesus just to define some boundaries for him. Who is my neighbour? And Jesus' answer effectively says that the right interpretation of this command is that there are to be no boundaries. The command love your neighbour as, as yourself is often misquoted as love your neighbour as you love yourself and used as some sort of justification for loving ourselves before we can love others or at least to justify the love of self. But, but the text here, this command, doesn't say love yourself, but rather love your neighbour as yourself. Our own self-love, self-interest, self-focus is, is assumed to be there, but it is the standard to which we are to love our neighbour, to which we are to love others. Now, whether we love ourselves in the right way is a different question, which we'll come on to later. But we are invariably self-focused and self-interested. And to love others as yourself means that there shouldn't be a boundary or difference between the interest we take in ourselves and the interest we have in others. We're to have a focus on and look to the interests of others as naturally, instinctively, as, as automatically, as unhesitatingly as we are self interested love others free from boundaries between ourself and them and in the story of the good samaritan jesus encourages us to to live and to love in a way where national boundaries where language where belief social status name skin color physical appearance history past experience reputation tradition and culture makes no difference to love your neighbor as yourself without boundaries is the ultimate in equality it means to remember that that you and other people are not identical but essentially substantially the same another human being like you they are your equals made in the image of god as his children people of worth and dignity. They have similar needs and desires, hopes and fears and limitations as you. Like you, they too are frail, weak, selfish and sometimes stupid and depraved. And yet much in our popular culture and increasingly our populist politics encourages us to support and love others who are just of similar viewpoints interests or beliefs. Social and other media reinforce the boundaries between us and those who appear different to us in some way and, and the bubbles that we that we live in just feed division, fear, suspicion, distrust and hate. You know on, on our street there is a family who live just a few doors away and the parents aren't from, from this country. And, and there, is a, there is a prejudice in my heart which stops me from loving them as I should. I don't hate, I, I just have not loved them as myself. I have treated them differently, not, not in an obvious way, but I've thought about them differently. My interest, my, my towards my, my love for my neighbour is, is biased. It, it's affected by those boundaries, in this case, related to, um, to their nationality, their ethnicity. And it's not just that. I, 
I also respond differently to 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 male and and female and to those who identify with with neither. I'm not loving my neighbour as myself without boundaries. And I need to repent of that and to change. And how about you? Are, are there parts of your your neighbourhood, your um, maybe your family or your, your wider communities or, or our society with whom you don't have any dealings at all. And, and why is that? Are there people who you avoid or who are just invisible to you or, um, or for whom you have suspicion, distrust or, or fear based on, well, you don't know exactly what. Where are the boundaries for you? Where are you not loving others as yourself? Where are the boundaries that you need to start crossing? In our prayers as, as individuals and as church in our local context, we need to ask God to tell us where they are, where, where our love is meeting boundaries and stopping. And then what do we do? Well. It's interesting how Jesus, at the end of his story, instructs the man to go and do likewise. So let us, the, the church, go to lead the way. Not, not waiting, but intentionally and to purposefully identify and cross those boundaries that exist in our own hearts and in our communities. And be the signpost and the antidote that both highlights and breaks down the divisions, the boundaries that just shouldn't be there, that offend our God. And as we do so, there's a couple of things we, we do well to look out for, which, which characterise loving our neighbours as ourselves, without boundaries. First of all, our minds immediately start filling with buts, don't they? But, but I don't have the time but I don't have the right skills or resources or, or what they need. But even if I do, they might not give it back. But, but I won't know what to say, but I might get rejected. But I don't really understand the situation or, or how best to help. But I might make things worse, but, but surely I'm not the best person here. And the Samaritan probably had many of those similar buts going through his mind but I am an unwelcome stranger in this place myself, but, but I might get hurt, but I might not be able to help, but it might be too late, but I might get drawn into this and get the blame. Jesus says we're to love without buts. Now it's normal for us to start saying but, and, and whilst it's often right to, to think things through before rushing in, when that when that but happens, when it pops into your mind, how about just pausing and remembering Jesus said to love your neighbour as yourself is just to act automatically and instinctively to love, free from boundaries, so also free from buts. The other thing to notice is that the Samaritan paid the cost, quite a significant cost, without much or probably any hope of recompense or reward. The man had been robbed and so was probably unable to repay him in any way. There was no benefit. There was no equation going on which asked, is this going to be worth it? Choosing how and who and when we love is, is not loving others as yourself. It's not love without boundaries. The very act of choosing can often be more about what we want, what suits my schedule what feels right. And we tend to choose based on some sort of investment or, or benefit for ourselves, if we're honest. Now, it is true that the need around us is often so great that we may be forced to choose because we, we just can't do everything. And I'm not sure there's a magic formula to deciding what is right for every situation, but, but we do need to pause and to be honest with ourselves when we are faced with that choice to ask, why am I choosing this rather than that? And is any part of that choice for my own benefit? 
it's exciting to think what might happen when people start loving others, loving their neighbours as ourselves, free from boundaries, buts or benefits. And we're going to listen to Andy Tufnell now as he talks to someone in, in our church family who regularly sees this sort of stuff happen. Well, as we seek opportunities to get to know uh, each other um, in church, better um, and get a sense of how God has been at work as well recently. Um, I have the opportunity now to uh, interview Helen Cranley who's been a member of Christchurch for what is it about 13 years. Um, uh, She's married to Sean and got three uh, amazing little boys uh, Oliver, um, Thomas and Jacob Um, and um, she's not just a wife and a mum, she's also working full-time as Programme Director for Safe Families for Children, um, as Programme Director for for them here in the Midlands. Um, So uh, an opportunity to ask ask you, Helen, uh, some questions here. Firstly, can you give us uh, an idea uh, of, in what you do, how you've seen God at work recently? Yeah, it's a great question, Andy. And at Safe Families, we have a huge privilege of seeing God at work all the time. But I think during lockdown, the uh, the difficult situation that so many families are going through becomes even more difficult. And we all know what isolation and anxiety is. We kind of all, all had our eyes opened much more widely to that now. Um, but we see God at work in that kind of the darker that it is, the more that the amazing acts of kindness that just normal people do um, has even more of a a great impact uh, on families. And there's been some amazing examples that gives us goosebumps about kind of how beautiful it is when people do step out of their comfort zone and bring good news to the poor. There are so many poor people in our city, not just kind of financially, but emotionally. And there is a real poverty of family in a lot of senses. Um, and at Safe Families, we want to be that extended family to people that don't have that. Um, so a great example of this is a lovely lady called Sally. Um, and she'd befriended a mum a couple of years ago, but had stayed in touch with her through Safe Families. Um, and she's got two boys. She has chronic health conditions. So she's got MS and diabetes. She herself has kind of, I'd say, quite an abusive family. Her mum really doesn't treat her how she should be treated. Um, But Sally's been like a second mum to her. And so Sally was looking out for her during lockdown or just asking how she was getting on and was getting a bit concerned about this mum who was saying, actually, I'm not doing so well. Things are pretty tough. She tried to ring the hospital. The hospital had said, you know, you need to just stay at home and ride out your symptoms of feeling poorly. Um, And Sally got in contact with us and said, look, can I can I go over and see her? I know we're in lockdown, but am I able to do that? And we said, look, it's fine with us. She's a vulnerable person. We'll give you the support you need. So she went over to this mum's house and she basically found her almost unconscious. And the two boys kind of hungry, not able to do kind of normal things that you'd expect children to do. And she said, you know what? We need to get you to hospital now. Um, And so she phoned the ambulance. The ambulance came and she went into intensive care for seven days um, and she nearly died and in that time Sally looked after her two boys and was the support that she needed. She was the family that that mum literally didn't have Um, and so we genuinely feel that Sally saved this mum's life. She kept that family together uh, and gave them the support that that they need, that everyone deserves to have Um, and it's just so sad isn't it that families get to that position of, of not having anyone that will look after them and take care of them um, so yeah, there's great stories like Sally's um, and this mum, but there's also just really simple things that people do. Um, so another uh, lady had been supporting a family with a daughter, I think a nine-year-old daughter, um, and their support had gone online, obviously, because they couldn't see each other with lockdown. And so this lady had been given maths lessons to this little nine-year-old. Um, and the parents kind of a few weeks after this had all started, was like, Do you know what, we are so thankful for you because... This, our daughter has been let down by so many people, but we know that you will turn up when you say you will. And we know that our daughter has a lovely time with you and you are a constant in her life. And for me, those stories are kind of equally as powerful because we know that when children develop, they need positive people around them that won't let them down. And that is those are seeds of positivity and hope that will last far beyond lockdown, that they are things that will be remembered. And it's what God asks us to do. You know, he asks us to be present in situations where we need to bring hope we are hope bringers so yeah 
Safe Families has a huge uh, privilege of being able to see the beginning and the ending of the stories. Um, so yeah, it's a fabulous place to be. <laughs> I love that. I love it. I mean, in little and large ways, uh, to be able to see ways in which people have responded to an inner call uh, to reach out um, and to, to see God uh, in his amazing timing uh, work by connecting people. Um, seeing God's timing on display is, is brilliant uh, in that first story. And, and I love that. The, um, the little ways in which when we step out and we serve, um, uh, we put ourselves out there. Uh, connecting with one person, perhaps we, we see God uh, by extension using what we've done uh, to bless other people even beyond that. Uh, and I love that. So thank you for those two examples of how God's been at work for you recently. Um, Helen, uh, for today, we are looking at um, in Luke chapter 10, verse 27, key verse, it says uh, in there that uh, uh, to, to, there's that call to, to love your neighbour as yourself. And the parable that follows is all about understanding who neighbour is um, uh, and how we might love them. But but actually, the, the often the forgotten bit is is the how do we um, love our neighbour as ourself and the as ourself gets forgotten often. Um, could you um, help us uh, understand perhaps a little bit of how for you uh, paying appropriate attention to caring for yourself and your own well-being has helped you to care for the health and the well-being uh, of those around you better? Yeah, I mean, it's quite a personal answer that I give, so I hope that's OK. Um, so I would say that I've learned the hard way about not looking after yourself and becoming overwhelmed and anxious and exhausted really with all of the things that you could be involved with and all the things that you want to be involved with. So I've learned the hard way about self-care um, and I'd say it's a journey that we're all on. Um, so just to pick out four things that have really been helpful for me. So first of all is working out how to rest well. Um, there's a great book by John Mark Comer called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry that I really recommend. It, there's a, some great bits about having a real Sabbath rest. Um, so for those of you that have young families or really busy jobs where your time is super pressured, um, I'd really recommend that. It's a lot about slowing down, paying attention to the important things um, and having good practices like a real day off where you really spend time doing the things that you enjoy. So for me, it's doing puzzles, um, you know, but it could be anything that, that gives you rest and just joy in your day. Um, and I really realise that that's hard work when you've got small children around. So if you want to talk to me about that, please do. I'd love to talk to you. Uh, the second thing I'd say, other than rest, um, is working on emotional well-being, which is something that I really feel passionately about that we don't talk a lot about in the church. I've just finished reading this amazing book, so I'm going to give it a plug. It's called Why Emotions Matter. Um, it's by Tristan and Jonathan Collins, um, and it really goes through some of those key emotions that we often put to one side and bury away um, and how we can be more emotionally healthy. There's some other great books out there. So Emotionally Healthy Spirituality by Pete Scazzaro is another great one. Um, so I'd really encourage you, if you've not really thought about the emotional side of yourself before, it's a, it's a really good thing to grapple with. And I honestly think it's made me more of a whole person where I understand myself, my behaviours, my thought patterns a lot better than I did. Um, so second was emotional well-being. Third one was boundaries. So it's really easy to fall into the mindset that we need to fix the world and fix the poor people around us and fix the people that are in trouble. Um, and absolutely, we're called to help people and we really want people to step up and be bold and be brave and to do things for God. But at the same time, you need to do that within healthy limitations of your own time and your own energy. Um, and setting boundaries can be quite hard to do. So that relates quite well to the last thing which I would say, which is about having a strong sense of community. Um, so at Safe Families, we really say that you are not one volunteer doing something on your own. You are part of a network of support. Um, so we encourage you to have people that you can offload on. Um, we would also, I would also say personally, being part of a community where you have maybe one or two people that you really know and are vulnerable with and can share about the difficulties that you're going through in your personal life um, is super important. But also being part of a wider community of people where... You know, you are just family. You are extended family. I cannot emphasise enough how beautiful it is 
when you are part of a family network in whatever form that is. And families are not straightforward. These are not communities that are straightforward, normal people. We are all quirky. Um, but if we are part of a loving community that loves each other despite our weird, quirky ways or our you know, circumstances, that is actually a glimpse of heaven. And I genuinely believe that a church should be family. That's what we're called to. We're called to bear with each other, to encourage each other. And that is really a therapeutic community to be part of. That's what I want to see. Brilliant. Thank you, Helen. Uh, four, four brilliant points there that I'm going to remember. Um, so looking at rest, uh, in, what was it? Emotional uh, well-being, um, brown boundaries, appropriate boundaries uh, and community and family life, uh, extended family, which is precisely what church life should be about. And home groups add to that as well. Um, so thank you, Helen. Some great stories and some good advice there from, from Helen. And, and as Helen said, there, there are so many around us who need help. So please do join our, our prayers after this service on the same YouTube channel, where this week Stephen Scott is taking us to places around our local community and give us, giving us the opportunity to love our neighbours through prayer, but also in prayer for our hearts and minds to be shaped by God be changed by him too. Because some of the stories Helen told suggest to me that loving your neighbour as yourself is, is a mindset, a, a way of life, and not just how we respond to individual situations. It's a mindset where we consider our time, our, our money, our possessions, our resources, not, not to be something we own within our boundaries, um, but uh, rather that we're stewards of those things which are to be used for the common good others benefit to no boundaries and to love your neighbor as as yourself as helen said it's loving someone else's family as though they were your own no boundaries and to love your neighbor as yourself is to share in their joy and their sorrow just to be there to be part of someone else's life and to try and understand and experience what they are going through as if we were experiencing it ourselves We've been reminded recently in particular that we need to find ways of standing alongside those who are experiencing racial discrimination. And we need to see the problem not as someone else's, not as theirs, but as ours too. To love your neighbour as yourself is to extend the benefit of the doubt, to withhold judgment. After all, we often give ourselves the benefit of the doubt thinking that, that we're right before we think we're wrong. And so we need to extend that, extend that equally to others. To love your neighbour as yourself with, with all that we, we buy, to, to eat, to, to wear, is, is making sure that we are as concerned and interested with the benefit to those who grew or made it as we are to the benefit to us. In our work, to, to love your neighbour as yourself is wherever possible to choose work, a career that doesn't just meet our own needs, but also provides for others too. To choose work that provides things people actually need, opportunities for those on the margins of society, um, protection for God's creation, things that promote justice and democracy, truth, beauty and peace. Now, if you're like me, there's probably a voice in your head which is saying, well, what about caring for myself? Is that part of the balance, this recipe for life? Well, Philippians chapter 2, verse 4 says this, Let each of you look not only to their own interests, but also to the interests of others. So, so there must be a healthy biblical way of, of, of balancing, looking after our, our own needs too. Whilst we're called to see others as more important than ourselves, we need to live in a way which acknowledges that, that I'm a human being with a body and, and a mind that, that God has given me to nourish and look after, that, that has spiritual, physical and emotional needs as, uh, and limits. Those, those limits, those boundaries that, that Helen talked about, limits that God himself has placed in me. Finding and accepting our God-given limits and choosing to receive God's gift of, of rest, food, of, 
uh, of recreation, of solitude, of life in all its abundance, those are acts of worship and obedience just as much as <clears throat> loving our neighbour. Denying that we have those needs, all those human limits, even as we pour out our lives for others, that can be a form of pride. To love your neighbour as yourself is to do so free from boundaries, from buts and from benefits. But we also want to do that free of destructive burnout and bitterness too. So perhaps a helpful question to ask, which, which keeps our focus on others, is what, what serves my neighbour best? A broken me or a whole me? We need to care for ourselves. But we need to let that care from, come from the right place. And just as there is an order in Jesus' commandments to, to love your God first, to, to love your neighbour, so we can follow that same pattern and, and balance when, when we're looking for our own needs to be met. Because we're looking to exercise self-care, not self-reliance. To seek God first. Jesus says, come to me, all who are labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. So cultivate good habits in meeting God in, in prayer through his word every day. Make space for yourself where, where you can, but, but when you do that, make sure you involve God in some way, even if it's just to say hello and to acknowledge his presence with you. He loves you and he longs to provide what you need. Then secondly, do what you can to put yourself in a position to be cared for by others. The church, our small groups are great for that. And Helen mentioned the importance of being connected and, and in community, supported by community. So don't give up on that. Don't, don't go it alone. Don't stop meeting or gathering with other Christians because the church, the body of Christ, is here and, and ready to step across their boundaries to love you as you step across your boundaries to love your neighbour. And then thirdly, tend to yourself. Follow Jesus' example, who regularly set time aside to, to be alone, um, but also to enjoy meals with, with friends. And the Bible tells us that, that even God himself takes rest. He takes the opportunity of, of stopping and simply experiencing the joy of being in the amazing world that he's made. Let's pray. God, thank you for showing us your vision of how the world should be, where we love our neighbours with no boundaries. Thank you for the work of safe families and other places where we see that actually happen. And pray for your blessing, provision, and care for Helen and her colleagues as they do their work. And show us now, today, this week, where, where boundaries stop us from loving others as we should. Give us courage to purposefully cross them, to love where it's needed. And as we do so, help us to turn to you, our source of life and peace and rest, each day and to love one another better, and to find moments in life when we can just be, and find joy in the world you've made. Amen.
may the peace of the Lord Christ go with you, wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. <laughs>